Shakespeare's Sonnet 146 actually isn't complete the way it was printed in the original quarto. The compositor of the quarto, we think, made a mistake. Here's how it was printed. Poor soul, the center of my sinful earth, my sinful earth, these rebel powers that thee array. Uh, now, one of the reasons why scholars think that this is a mistake is because metrically this does not fit. My sinful earth, these rebel powers, that the array. So scholars don't know what's missing, they just know that this isn't right. So, a number of people have suggested possibility. Colin Burrow says spoiled by seems to make sense. Uh, Helen Vendler makes an argument for the word feeding. Poor soul, the center of my sinful earth, spoiled by these rebel powers or feeding these rebel powers. We don't actually know what Shakespeare intended here. Nevertheless, this is a sonnet uh, about a soul's dialogue with the body. This would be a convention that will become increasingly popular during the time of Marvell uh, and in and, and the time of Dunn, which is roughly around this time shortly after. Others like Sir Philip Sidney and Bartholomew Griffin will use this dialogue of the soul, of the body speaking to the soul and vice versa. But here, it seems like the body is addressing the soul. Poor soul, he addresses the center of my sinful earth. So we know that the body is the one that's speaking, my sinful earth. Uh, the body in the Judeo-Christian tradition was made of earth, boiled by or feeding these rebel powers that the array, rebel powers, that is the earth that arrays or dresses the soul. The body is the dress of the soul, but the body is a rebel power. So this is getting a little theological here, but we see that it doesn't get very Christian at all. Painting thy outward walls so costly gay. O soul, why are you longing within? Painting thy outward walls so costly gay. Why are you so busied about uh, the things material, outward walls, the body? Don't uh, decorate yourself so. It doesn't matter. Kind of homiletic. The body speaking to the soul. Why so large costs? having so short a lease. This line here is very similar to the one in Sonnet 18. Summer's lease hath all too short a date. Here, life itself is a short lease. Why so large a cost, having so short a lease, dost thou upon thy fading mansion spend? The fading mansion, another figure for the body and the outward walls as well. The conceit here is that the soul is spending a lot on the body, spending a lot of attention, time on what will fade. Shall worms, inheritors of this excess, this excess, a thing for the body, another word for the body, eat up thy charge, also the body. The body is the soul's charge. Is this thy body's end? Then soul, rhetorically, the answer would be no. In that case, here we have the volta, the application. Then soul, live thou upon thy servant's loss. The servant is the body. Live upon the loss of the body and let that pine to aggravate thy store. We have pine here and pine here, which could mean longing, but likely means starvation. Aggravate means to increase and let that starvation or lack, increase thy store. So this is an, an opposite, two opposites juxtaposed together here. By terms divine in selling hours of dross. Here's the solution. Then so live upon your servant's loss, live upon the body's death, and let that decrease increase thy store. By terms divine purchase. Here we have the idea of, of cost. Previously, the soul was um, spending on the body, which is only here for a short time. It's such a large cost for so short a time to be. In that case, by terms divine. By terms. Of course, the sound of this rings back to the worms here. Shall worms, inheritors of this excess, by terms divine and selling hours of dross. Dross, worthlessness. So get rid of the hours of dross or uselessness within be fed, not without, not with the out, outward walls. Don't clothe the outward walls of the body, but feed the inside, the soul, 
without be rich no more, be rich inside, not on the outside. It's kind of confusing language here. Finally, the end conclusion here in the couplet. So shalt thou feed on death, speaking to the soul. In doing so, you'll feed on death that feeds on men. And death once dead, there's no more dying then. It's a complicated son sonnet. It's not the kind of poem we would expect in this convention. Usually a dialogue between the body and soul is, they tend to be meditations on death that, that end with a kind of consolation or an application. There's certainly an application here. And the application is to stop spending so much time, money, or energy, or emotion on the body, on the outward dress, and instead focus on the inside. And in doing that, the soul will feed on the death of the body, meaning that it will gain increase by terms divine, seeking uh, holy things and not earthly things. In death once dead, there's no more dying then. That's such a strange couplet. Relies on the Christian paradox that death shall die, or death is swallowed up, or that the death of Christ defeated death. This whole theological idea, the kind of paradox a lot of Herbert's poetry relies on, but this is not really a Christian sonnet. There's no resurrection, there's no Christ's death. It's merely moral. And at the same time, it, sin it seems to rely upon the very paradoxical logic of Christianity. It's, it's a complicated sonnet, but hopefully uh, this elucidated some aspects of the sonnet. Anyway, thanks for joining me, and until next time.